Thank you, Ellie. Our next speaker who came to the rescue is the wonderful Dinora Friedman Morvinsky. She's a, a professor at the Faculty of Life Sciences here at Tel Aviv University. She's a board member of the ISGCT, the Israel Gene Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. And there is a co-organizer of next week's in person. Everybody is becoming courageous now. Annual meeting of the ISGCT here at Tel Aviv University at Anu Museum. So good luck with that event. And she will talk to us about CAR T, cell immunotherapy. Thank you, Dino. So yeah, thanks for staying, and, and and thanks for the invitation. And I will, I'm happy and honored to come after Cyril, my colleague in cell therapy, and and I'm happy that he introduced you to the uh, cell therapy and immunotherapy and the world we are all trying to improve. I'm always la love to hear new and fresh ideas to improve, because I really a believer of uh, immunotherapy and cell therapy, and specifically. You will understand why soon on CAR T cells. Um, I don't need this introduction anymore because I think we already heard, but I will focus, yes, on this uh, CAR T therapy, chimeric antigen receptor therapy, and the way that is working today. That uh, yes, this is a treatment that we currently patients are getting in the clinics mostly, and you will understand soon why. Uh, um, B cell malignancy patients uh, are getting this treatment. And the idea is to remove the blood cells uh, from the patient to get the T cells and then engineer these T cells ex vivo on a dish, uh, introduce them either, and today we have mostly in the clinics by viral vectors, but the world of the non viral vectors is coming and it's even amazing how recently we saw a paper that is not oncology, but they were even able to bring these in vivo, introduce CAR T cells by nanoparticles uh, directly into patients and see their functionality in vivo. So the field is moving forward and we will see many things coming in that respect. And so once you engineer these cells and what you introduce is what you see here is the structure of the CAR T. You have this, the signaling, I mean the recognition uh, signal. It's like uh, Cyril said, we are mostly using single chain antibodies, but you can switch that. And we are also in the lab trying to bring with new ideas how we can use different ways to bring and to recognize uh, antigens on tumor cells, not just by antibodies. And then we have the intracellular cytoplasmic domain that brings the signaling to the T cell. So the, the, once you expand these T cells, you can bring them back to the patient and hopefully this T cell will know how to do the work because T cells know how to kill tumor cells that just are missing a lot of information sometimes, for example, how to recognize them and to, to activate. So that's what the CAR is helping here. Now, as I said, these CAR T cells are very successful today in treating B cell malignancies. And now we want to bring this successful, uh, the success, I will say, into the treatment of solid tumors. But here we have many challenges. Uh, challenges that are not maybe present, some are, you know, that we sh are shared by the B cell malignancies, but in tu solid tumors, we have extra problems. And one of them, and I will only summarize some of these obstacles, one is tumor heterogeneity and antigen escape. The other will be CAR T cell trafficking and infiltration into this mass of tumor. And then, and we have already hear a lot of the tumor microenvironment, how immune suppressive uh, this microenvironment in solid tumors is. And in addition, we also have a nutrient restricted tumor microenvironment, which is also very important. And I don't have time today, but we have a project that are trying to uh, maybe give these CAR T cells an advantage on this uh, nutrient deprived 
uh, microenvironment. But today, I had to pick one uh, specific obstacle for these 20 minutes, so I decided to go to tumor heterogeneity to show you one aspect, but again, I don't believe that by going to, I mean, all of us in the field will have to bring our ideas and come together to enhance and to bring more efficacy. So each one taking one step and contributing to this puzzle, I think will become much uh, stronger uh, with new ideas and strategies to, to treat uh, solid tumors. So, tumor heterogeneity. Yes, uh, it comes in many different flavors. Uh, we have, for example, intra and intertumor heterogeneity. And intertumor heterogeneity is if you take biopsies from different parts of the same tumor, you will find differences. Not all, it's a clonal differences, you have mutational differences. Today, I also like to uh, introduce that we also not only look at the mutations, but also the cell states. This also contributes to the different uh, heterogeneity that we have in the tumor. And then we know the intertumor heterogeneity. Two patients diagnosed with the same type of tumor can present completely different set of mutations, even though by histology or by pathology you will be recognized with the same type of tumor. Then we have a temporal heterogeneity. I mean, temporal meaning that early stages and as tumor advances, differences and the tumor changes. And of course, we heard before about primary and metastatic tumors, they also change. So tumor heterogeneity, many flavors. And I'm actually working in my lab with one of the most heterogeneous uh, human tumors, glioblastoma, or in short, we call them GBM, is the most malignant of the primary uh, brain tumors and is almost always fatal. I mean, patients that are diagnosed with, with this disease, the, even if they undergo the standard of care uh, treatment, which will be first surgery, if it's possible, we're talking about the brain, so it's not always uh, easy to operate or it's not feasible to operate, but then the, after surgery, these patients will go through chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and there are also some new things that are coming, uh, but not many, and that's why we are looking for new uh, treatments for these patients. But even though they go through this treatment, they still succumb to their disease with an average of uh, survival between 15 to 8 months. I will say that today we can say that the average is even 6 months later, it's 18 months, which before was 12, 15. Uh, malignant gliomas are among one of the most vascular human tumors, and I will come back to this because it's kind of related with the story that I want to tell you today. Now, we have learned many things about uh, glioblastoma from human samples, from biopsies. For example, as an, an, as an example, glioblastoma was the first uh, tumor type to be sequenced by what we all know as the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Network Atlas. So, of course, all this data and all this information was very instructive for the uh, research that we're doing in terms of mutations, oncogenic drivers, uh, many things that we can learn from this sequencing data. But in my lab, we are big fans of mouse models of human diseases. And I think in this forum, we really need to bring the importance of the development, as you know, Ellie said before, of preclinical models, because we cannot uh, forget that many of the drugs that we have today in the, in the clinics, and one of the latest uh, advances, I would say, immunotherapy, checkpoint blockades, they were actually first uh, identified using preclinical uh, models in mice. So I think it's very important. And in our case, we, are, we have developed a mouse model that we believe recapitulates the disease as close as we can, uh, GBM. So I want to introduce the model because we use this model as a preclinical testing of what I introduced the CAR-T. So in this model, we use lentiviral vectors uh, in order to bring the oncogenic drivers or the tumor suppressors directly into the brain of transgenic mice. In this system, it's an on and off system. We can regulate when the expression of these oncogenes will happen in cell-specific matter. For those who understand, it's a Crelox P system. So in the presence of the enzyme, then we will have expression of the oncogene. Uh, not, we can then use any oncogene or tumor suppressor that we can take from human data. So we do use now this human data, uh, the TCG analysis, to bring these oncogenes into these vectors and generate the tumors. We also have flexibility in terms of where to inject the viruses. So you know that in brain tumors is one 
package, but we have different type of tumors and the location can change and the cell, the cell type can change. So even having different uh, modulation of where you inject the viruses can change the type of the tumor. And the last thing I would say that I'm not going to expand today, but we are using in the lab the same method to induce pediatric being tumors, just by injecting the viruses with different oncogenic settings into newborn pups. So today I will focus on, on glioblastoma and show you how specific this system is. Here is just um, a histology of GFAP Cree transgenic mice, Cree is expressed on the astrocyte promoter, and you see that the Cree is specific for astrocytes, not expressing neurons, and when we inject our viruses only in the cell type that expresses the Cree, the oncogene will be uh, expressed. So what happens when we inject the viruses into a wild type mouse? We don't have expression of the oncogene. Only in the Cree expressing is going to be, uh, the oncogene will be turned on. So I wanted to introduce you the model to kind of bring you the story and how this, why we're using this model, because going back, this also represents the heterogeneity. By inducing the tumors, you also have the heterogeneity that we brings uh, with it. So a story, and actually based on uh, what Avi said, sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's serendipity, or how you come up with these uh, novel markers in, in cancer. So this story, the beginning, uh, starts with conversation of two friends. Uh, one saying, I'm working with the most vascular human tumor. The other one sharing, I'm developing drugs for or targeting for vasculature, antiangiogenesis. So that's how uh, we actually start working together. Uh, she was working at the lab of Erki Roslati, where they believe in vascular zip codes. I mean, tumor, vasculature that expresses specific markers, and then they can design peptides, homing peptides that actually go specifically to the vasculature of tumors, but not to healthy vasculature. And to make really the story, the, the story uh, short, we use one of these peptides, we coated nanoparticles, and we try to treat a uh, GBM. Uh, we also add, of course, a functional moiety that is a propoptotic peptide. And then we were able to show that we can actually use the homing peptide to target GBM specifically. And this is to show you that it's not going to other healthy organs. The next step was, what is the receptor of these homing peptides, right? These are recognizing something in the tumor or in the tumor vasculature. And that's how we came up with our target. Our target is P32, uh, which is actually expressed in healthy cells only in the mitochondria, but is expressed on the surface of tumor cells. And that for us, or for me actually coming from a background of immunotherapy and CAR T therapy, that light, I mean the bulb light, when you think about the idea, if I have a specific biomarker that it's expressing healthy cells inside the cell, but in tumors on the surface, that of course bring me to, to design the immunotherapy. So just, is, just to show that it's expressed really only in cancer cells, uh, many carcinomas, but it's not expressed on normal tissue. Like I said, we don't see much expression and it's not expressed on the surface. So we brought, we wanted to validate this marker. We showed that is indeed, as the, the grade of the uh, brain tumors goes up, also the expression of P32, this is human, patients that we analyze. We also have our models, as I said before, we have the model of the syngenetic. We can uh, inject uh, tumor cells that, brought, that we established from our lentiviral uh, system and transplant them back to uh, mice that have an immune system. Or we have the PDX. And in all of them, you can see very specific expression of P32 in the tumor area, but not in the adjacent uh, tissue. We also checked the TCGA, of course, and we saw the messenger RNA is overexpressed. But for us, more importantly, it's expressed in any of the cells that we analyze on the surface of these cell lines, either established cell lines, murine cell lines, and patient-derived cell lines. So as I said before, that brought me back to my training. And I had the honor to be trained by the pioneer of the CAR T cell uh, modality, Zeli Gashar. And this is me and my time preparing tons and tons of CAR T cells when I was a PhD. So, of course, the idea was to take the uh, design a second generation CAR T that now we are using an antibody, a single chain uh, SVC, to target P32. 
And so here I'm going to show you two different models. We work always in parallel with a marine system and also a human uh, system. Why? Because we always, and all the ones that are here, sitting here working with mouse models, we always get the question, what is the relevance for the human disease? So we are working in parallel to show you that indeed, and we were also lucky that this antibody actually cross, uh, I mean, recognizes both the murine P32 as well as the human P32. So we transduce uh, murine and human lymphocytes. Uh, we had a average of uh, efficiency of transfection or transduction actually because we use retroviruses of 40% on average. And we have here the, the murine system. We first check the functionality of these CAR T cells in vitro. And for that, we have many controls. We have an irrelevant uh, CAR T, which targets a completely different molecule not related with P32. We also knock down the expression of P32 in these cell lines. And as you can see, these CAR T are very specific only to the cells that are expressing P32, where the relevant CAR T even don't recognize them. So this is very important. We decide the toxic effect, proliferation, and interferon gamma for stimulation. Same line of experiments in parallel uh, with the human lymphocytes, now using two different uh, human glioma lines. One is an established line, the other one is a patient drive line. And so now that we check the functionality of this system in vitro, we went of course in vivo. And here we have three different models. And for each different model, we also use different route of administration of the CAR T. So the first model that I'm showing here is a syngenic model, meaning that we are transplanting our glioma, murine glioma cells directly into the brain. And these have the whole, these are immune competent mice. And we administer this CAR T systemically in the tail vein. And as you can see, only the ones that were injected with the relevant specific CAR T responded, while the ones injected with the irrelevant CAR T succumbed to the disease. And as you can see here, we have a 30% survival. I don't have you know, time to show you, but of course we follow uh, by uh, living, I mean, in bioluminescence uh, living imaging. So we know that these, all these uh, mice had tumors. And so these ones that were eventually in a way cured, we can say 30% of success. The next one, oh, and one more thing that I think for me is important to say is that not only we validated that these are uh, functional because they were able to extend the survival, but think that these CAR T that were administered systemically were able to home to the brain, which is not something easy to do, uh, to get into the brain is a very, some people would say it's difficult because of the BBB, we have to consider two things. In GBM, we have a compromised PBB, and also T cells can extravasate. So for them, it's much easier to get into these tumors. But it, still, they needed to infiltrate and traffic. So that's something that I think is important, uh, having a cisgenic mouse model. The second one is using an established model, U87. And here, we also got an expert, but here we use a different route. We went intratumor, and we also saw a really nice effect. And I think the most relevant one is the third model. This is a very aggressive patient drive uh, model, xenograft. Uh, 20 days is the latency, so we have to come very early with the CAR T. And here we use two different routes of administration intratumor and intraventricular. Why? Because at the time we were doing this. Um, these experiments, there was a report, a New England Journal of Medicine report for the first, one of the first patients treated with a CAR T in glioma, and they showed that intraventricular administration had a much better effect than given these intratumors. So I think for us being in this, in the research side, we need to all the time learn for what happens in the clinic, be updated what happened in the clinic to bring this and try to test it in our preclinical systems. I think it's something that we have to learn. Uh, of course, here we analyze the tumors after treatment and you can see that we were able to reduce uh, the number of cells that express P32, meaning yes, they reached the tumor, they were able to kill, but of course, and we will bring, get to that, we were not able to cure all the mice, right? And probably because even though we killed the cells expressing P32, something that maybe I forgot to mention at the beginning, when we analyzed the expression, as I said, it's very heterogeneous. So we have 30% of the tumors. So what are the other, third, the other uh, cells expressing? That's something that we have to consider. 
I want to do here uh, tell you about uh, something else that also working with preclinical uh, mouse models we uh, identify is that in glioma uh, we found that the tumor cells can also form their own blood vessels. That's something that uh, it's very, uh, I would say, frightening, scare that the own uh, tumors can form their blood vessels. So we won't only have angiogenic and regular angiogenesis, we also have tumor differentiation into endothelial cells. Why this is important for this story is because at the time when I told you the story about the nanoparticles, they were homing to the tumor vasculature, right? So that means that P32 should be expressed also in this endothelial, tumor-derived endothelial cells. So we went back to our system and indeed we validated that these tumor-derived endothelial cells express P32. We went back to the treated mice uh, with the relevant and irrelevant CAR-T and we noticed that the ones that were treated with the, the P32 specific CAR-T had less angiogenic burden, meaning that the CAR-T were not only attacking tumor cells, but they're also attacking the tumor-driven endothelial cells. And so it, that's why it brings me to my title, right? Dual effect. We have an anti-tumor effect, but also at the same time an anti-angiogenic effect, which I think is something that we have to bear in mind for CAR-T cells. They can have multi effect on the tumors, not only killing cells. Uh, of course, we validated all what I'm saying now uh, in vitro. So, uh, what I, in my last uh, probably two slides, what I want to say is that, yes, we are still uh, in the field searching all the time for novel antigens because we are trying to tackle the tumor heterogeneity and antigen escape. And what you see in this cartoon is that these are the first three antigens that were that reached clinical trials with CAR T in glioma patients, and today their list is getting larger and larger. And this is something good. Why? Because, as I said, heterogeneity is a problem, and maybe we cannot uh, have one single antigen that will work only for these patients. We need to have a basket with several alternatives, and, and I believe that at least our contribution to this field is, yes, we brought one more novel antigen that we can design CAR T cells. But as many people uh, mentioned before, we all are believers of com combinatorial treatment, right? We cannot go with one single shot and aim to kill these tumors. We will need to come with different strategies. So where are we taking the story of the P32? I believe one option would be to um, design dual target CAR T. If we have now several targets that we can uh, engineer our CAR T cells, and we have several strategies to do that, we can go for bisistronic CAR T cells expressing two different CARs from a single vector. We can go to tandem CAR T. This is very difficult because you have to think about the conformational system and which one comes first and how large the linker between the two should be, co-administration, co-transduction. And so here we can use our P32 in combination to the known antigens that I showed you before or keep uh, looking for new antigens, and I can tell you that in our lab we are looking for even non-conventional, would say, antigens. Usually CAR-T are directed to surface express uh, antigens. We are going now in collaboration with Teva, that I think Dan is here. We have now a, a collaboration trying to develop a CAR-T that actually targets something that is not expressed on the surface of the tumor, but is in the tumor area. And we believe that by uh, in by having, for example, this dual target, one that is most homogeneously distributing the tumor, and one that actually targets the tumor, kind of the bite system, but in another concept, I believe we can come with a better option. So I only show you uh, one aspect, but I don't believe we can only target tumor heterogeneity. In the lab, we're working with tumor microenvironment, trying to come with different aspects to, to enjoy. So, with that, I will thank uh, you for staying and, and for the last talk. Uh, of course, all my collaborators uh, from Zelix Lab, yes, I went back and collaborated with them, with Anad that is leading with Tovavax. Uh, we have collaborators from Europe in this project. The two person, very important, the students that did the work. And of course, I always have to thank our funding agencies. We couldn't have done it without you. So thank you very much for your attention. So I'll be happy to answer any question you have.
Thank you, Dino. Fantastic work. Uh, maybe I'll start as the devil's advocate. You, you mentioned the HER2 and EGFR and their success in the clinic, but they were successful in, in other tumors like breast cancer and, of course, uh, GI cancers. But we haven't seen this occurring, even with EGFR mutated glioblastoma, we didn't see this uh, happening in, in glioblastoma. What makes you think that P32 P32 will be different? So I don't think it will be different, actually what I'm saying. And, you know, you need, I always, in, in brain tumors, I want to take success. What is success? Yes, we are not curing the, 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 the patient. But, but we notice even the EGFR V3 studies show that the CAR T are doing their work. They are killing the tumors that are expressing the target. But what, as I said, is not enough. Right, you need to come. So what I believe is P32 is bringing one more. If the patient will escape to the treatment with CAR T EGFR, then you will come with P32. Or from the beginning, you will start designing these cocktails of CAR T and giving. So if you attack the, from the beginning with more targets, maybe the tumor escape. You don't give the time for the tumor. That's one aspect. But you you can't forget about the other things that are you know suppressing the the CAR T. But I think. Yes, you're right. There's no success in curing the patient, but there was success of the CAR T. They did their job. They found their targets, they killed them. It was not enough. So I believe P32 will bring maybe one more step, and we need to you know, bring more, more, more antigens to have this combinatorial trial. Of That's what I believe. Uh, but of course, it will have to come together with other things too. Yeah. Do you think there are other ways to target CAR T with uh, in terms of solid tumors as opposed to their success in hematological malignancies, well, maybe B thirty two or combinations will help you. I believe there will be differently in solid tumors. We will have to count combinations. It's impossible to target with one single one. I mean, CD nine even for CD nineteen, there's also relapse sometimes, even though it's so generally expressed. Uh, but with solid tumors, I don't think one single shot will help we will have to come to combinatorial. How combinatorial? Dual CAR T's is one option, but there are probably different options, so we need to think how to do it. Thank you. The questions? <laughs> so, so if nobody else wants to ask, then I have two questions, actually. And maybe they are related, I'm not sure. So, so the first, one beautiful thing about immunotherapy, and I guess same for CAR T cell, when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, you get cures. And, and when you look at, the, at your mice, it looks more like chemotherapy or, or the bio, um, you know, the, the targeted therapies. Bye. So all of them die eventually. So, so there is some sort of, a, of an innate resistance mechanism uh, in, in your tumors. Do you know uh, what that is? And, and the other question is, do you have an idea why P32 is expressed on the surface of cancer cells? And mm -hmm. so maybe a resistance mechanism could be just to stop expressing it. So two beautiful questions. And, and I think it, one concept, my students actually, we change the way we look at this kaplan Mayer. At the beginning, we were saying, oh, we have these survivals and we forgot. Now we call them responders and non-responders. We, we don't look at them as the ones that succumb to the disease and the ones that survive. I mean, we need to start understanding why these are responders and the differences. And I can tell you that we are now analyzing, of course, the tumor microenvironment and how different is the environment after treatment. Uh, how the CAR T in the responders versus non-responders, and what was the difference to learn from you know the responders, and for for the next round of, of treatment, we will be able to combine and understand you know what else we need to do to 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 bring these non-responders to the group of responders. So that's what I believe we need to change you know the concept of how we look at these graphs and what we learn from this graph. That is on the first one, and I hope I answer to your question. And the second one, uh, that is one of the questions that our viewers ask in our paper, and I can only speculate. I don't know if you were one of them, uh, but I can only speculate uh, on what is the role of P32. And, and while, while looking at the literature, um, the tumors have to sense 
changes in the extracellular matrix. They need to all the time uh, adapt right, to a changing tumor. And so someone needs to sense these changes and translate it to the tumor so the tumor can readapt all the time to these changes. So what uh, we notice is that changes in the ECM triggers, and one of them is hyaluronic acid, it's very uh, highly expressed in the ECM of, um, of brain tumors. The sensing of hyaluronic acid brings this, uh, this information to the mitochondria, and they show, they show that mitochondrial proteins are going back to the surface as another way of sensing the changes. I believe that maybe that is what P32, that's why in healthy cells you don't have them in the surface, they're not needed, but in tumors they need to shuffle proteins to have dual function. That's speculations, of course, uh, but for us it's beautiful that healthy cells, you know, one of the things that I think we learn also with P32 as opposed to other targets that uh, no toxicity, no off tumor effect. So that's something very important that we're looking for also for a novel bio biomarker or target. And this is the beauty of, uh, of P32, I guess. Hope I answer your question. Okay, thank you, Dino. Thank you, everyone. And so with that, we come to the end of this uh, wonderful symposium. I would like to, to thank so many people for helping me making this come through. So first and foremost, the uh, Jack Barocas and his uh, team for helping with all the technicalities. Every year, Jack reminds us of the World Cancer Day and to organize an event, so thank you for that. I would like to thank <laughs> and for being responsible to broadcast it live on, on YouTube, so thank you for that. Uh, to Judith ben Porat, Ayelet Khashdi, thank you for all your administrative help. To Ron Kleiner and Daniela Vaskovic for all the help with the organizing everything around this day. And of course, to all the wonderful, wonderful speakers uh, sharing with us their exciting science and clinical work. So I'm really grateful for you to for coming here and sharing this information with us. So thank you all, have a nice day, keep safe.